Hello, I'm excited to be sharing my enthusiasm for this wonderful book. And uh, this is the title and there's some links because you can actually go get this even as we're talking and get it and download it. Let's see. Okay, right. I'm gonna give a short discussion around it. We have time for talking. Okay, keep going. Here it is, here's my starting page. So this is the cover. Um, my exposure to this book has been through to the Pivot conference that we did in June around decolonizing design and also, as I mentioned, through teaching on development theory, looking for alternatives. And um, we all are appreciating the introduction to the Pluriverse. This book, not only is it free, it's getting amazing reviews. It's actually free digitally, but you can pay $15 and get um, get the, the print version, which I have. It's been very well received by a range of scholars and practitioners from literally around the world. And I just put a few here to capture the breadth of global commentary and appreciations from the Quechua indigenous leader to Chinese scholars, South African philosophers, European and American um, academics. You know, just excited to see a range of alternatives, rethinking what it means to be human, challenging the cognitive supremacy of the West, you know, destabilizing a claim to universal knowledge, you know, overcoming linear ideas of progress. There are three ways to think about this book. First is that this pluriversal post-development dictionary, um, it's PPDD, sorry, builds on the original post-development dictionary by Wolfgang Sachs and a bunch of others that came out in the late 80s, early 90s which had a lot of chapters that critique the development project from feminist ecological lenses, post-colonial indigenous thinkers. And now this new book is called the Pluriverse Post-Development Dictionary. So very clearly building on that idea and challenging development, recognizing it as a grand narrative of the 20th century. It touches on a few major crises, several mainstream ideas, but most of the book is about alternatives. The book was a collaborative effort uh, with hundreds of contributors it's free in the Creative Commons. It's both academic and, and praxis oriented. It's uh, easy to dip into and out of. Each essay is a short five to 10 minute read. And each has a lot more references and reading. So it actually feels a lot more like an encyclopedia. And you can you could use this as a text or reference, but it's also just inspiring. You can just learn about the pluriverse happening on every continent. So this book arose from a few conversations with a few of uh, the authors who are here in this, um, in this um, scene here. Ashish Kothari is an environmentalist in India and um, a sociologist as well. Ariel Sally is an Australian eco-feminist political ecology scholar. Arturo Escobar, who have already been introduced to in this book club, he's behind the um, pluriversal designs, he's an anthropologist. Federico de Maria, also a political ecologist, is uh, in the world of degrowth. In fact, um, the editors got together at a degrowth conference and had this idea for this book. Finally, Alberto Acosta, who is an Ecuadorian economist and ran for president in Ecuador and actually, actually behind the constitution that has embraced nature and the rights of nature. Once again, that's the link to the book, so you, you, could, you could click on that. So these editors um, have, have an introductory essay that's Okay, it's maybe a 20 minute read, not, not five, but it's a really brilliant take on development, crises we face, why this book is needed. And this quote here just captures why the, how the pluriverse is bringing together indigenous, critical social movements, spiritual traditions and others. And they're asking questions like, what is so badly wrong with everyday life today? Who is responsible for it? What would a better life look like how do we get there? What is a life worth living? And how can conditions that would allow that to happen be met? So these perspectives compose a pluriverse, a world where many worlds fit. All people's worlds should coexist with dignity and peace without being subjected to diminishment, exploitation, and misery. And they um, make reference to the um, Zapatista roots of this pluriverse from this phrase, right? Many words are walked in the world, many worlds are made, many worlds make us. In the world of the powerful, there is room only for the big and their helpers. In the world we want, everybody fits. Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to move along now and talk about part one of the book, which is really about the crises we face and the role of development. And there was um, an essay for each um, each human, each continent that has human populations on it. And here's a, I just grabbed a quote from each. Nemo Bassi, who was with Friends of the Earth in Nigeria, speaks of the violence of colonization of Africa, how development just continues that. Um, Vandana Shiva speaks of the separation of people from nature, and people from each other. Kirk Huffman writes of devastating damage to oceanic peoples and lands and brought by many actors over a century where development actors are just the latest. Phil McMichael uh, in the US brings a critical political ecology lens to the project of development. Jose uh, Maria Tortosa writes that we are all now developed. And um, it's Maristela Scampa who speaks to these, who, who relates these different Latin American critiques over many years, which have returned to extractivism. So these six essays capture the nature of crisis embedded in global systems of capitalism. These are like structural designs that have been hundreds of years in the making and accelerating the post-World War II development. And it's tempting to look for solutions and new technologies and designs and policy discourses that are coming up late in the United States, in Europe, the United Nations, so part of the book has to deal with some of these mainstream ideas that actually might cause more harm than good. There are 17 essays by 17 authors who unpack and challenge ideas that we might be putting hope in. So I just highlight a couple. One for, for a design audience, one is um, circular economy thinking, which I used to teach and, and, and work in myself. So this comes from industrial ecology and dematerialization and cradle, cradle design. And the author's not criticizing that per se, but saying that look, the world's actually already consuming more energy and materials overall, just the growth and consumerism. So circular economy is, is a partial solution to much part, larger overhaul. Um, even the popular SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goal, Goals, are under critique in this section of essays. They still call for economic growth. That's number eight. It's a whole bunch of indicators that are toothless. They're hopeless. They're like the Millennium Development Goals. They were not met. It's unlikely that these are going to be met. And the author says these are just survival goals. There's not even really an aspiration to genuine development. That's in one of the essays. So there are others. We'll move along to part three, which is the better news, the people's blurry verse. Part three is the biggest in the main section of the book. It's a good three quarters of the, uh, of the whole thing. And it has over 100 short chapters, each by a different author, organized from A to Z by ideas and concepts and practices, including Rwandan Agasiro um, to the Zapatista autonomy through spiritual practices, indigenous cosmovisions from all regions, new constitutions respecting nature, the communing and the solidarity movement, holistic agricultural practices to territorial governance, and they encompass some of these values, diversity and plurality, autonomy and self-reliance, solidarity and reciprocity, commons and collective ethics, oneness with the rights of nature, interdependence, simplicity and enoughness, inclusiveness and dignity, justice and equity, non-hierarchy, dignity of labor, rights and responsibilities, ecological sustainability, nonviolence and peace. So all the entries are incredible to read and they all address some of those earlier questions and they all reflect lots of these ethical themes. And it was really hard for me to choose, but I just picked three to highlight today. One is the idea of food sovereignty and autonomy. And this is linked to the well-known Via Campesina movement, uh, a challenge to mainstream food security and industrial food systems. It's a movement that privileges peasants and small-scale farmers and local producers and artisanal fisher peoples. It makes space for the thriving of life and promotes solidarity among producers and consumers and values diversity as plant and cultural lives. And it's very distinctly not 
the same as food security of the mainstream idea of the World Food Program. So this is an analytical framework, a social movement, and a political project. Now let's move to another continent. And there's this concept of Ubuntu by South African scholar Leslie Lagrange, who writes about this fusion of Southern African ideas from Zulu and Bantu and other languages and traditions, like solidarity among humans for justice and environmental sustainability. Ubuntu is a form of power within all beings that serves to enhance life, not thwart it. The notion of Ubuntu, Ngumu, and Tunga, Banya, Bantu. We are, therefore I am. Pretty cool. Then the concept of worker-led production, a diverse set of practices that aims to give protagonism to the subjects of labor, the workers themselves. And these are some of the ideas here on the screen that are um, uh, ways to claim back spaces in enterprises and in production area for, for workers. There are lots of ideas and examples. It's not a trivial issue. And uh, like cooperatives and worker-owned enterprises, worker self-management, and workplace recuperation, where like in Argentina and Uruguay, they recovered these abandoned companies and took them over for worker ownership. And that moved to Europe. And then there's various little companies, um, worker-owned companies and worker-managed companies. So right now I'm thinking about what this might look like for professors or academics to do this, to disaggregate from a, the accreditation and certification of a corporate higher education institution. Look forward to talking about that. So those are the three. I'll stop there. We just now at this point we open it up to discussion. And um, to catalyze that, it's just a, a prompt is that if you do have it, you can download, look at the PDF, and you can just browse through part three of the table of contents. And, Generally, I'm thinking, what is an idea from the Pluriverse that you're excited to hear more about or talk about? What is an idea from part two of those reformist ideas that you thought might be a good idea and now you're wondering about? So I'm going to stop there. Ian asked if we could share the link to the PowerPoint. Yeah, let me do that. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to see... But there are two ways of, of seeing this publication online. And as we talk, I'm trying to see if I can find the other way. But yes, we, we all should use the link that Laura sent us. Um, we send a request to the authors. And then uh, Kotari also has it on his research gate. Um, so we, we could also look at it there. Mm -hmm. And so what normally happens in our group is that some people would have read the book and some people would not have read um, Renata, I know you've read it. I, today I am solidly in the not have read camp, right? Um, and Renata, I know that you are solidly in the have read camp. So I don't know if you want to respond to um, Laura's question right now. I'm just uh, choosing because it's difficult to choose the one that I, that I really like because it comes from so many different places that's what is amazing about this mm -hmm. dictionary mm -hmm. so you can just see uh, there are things that are uh, closer to me that refers to, to experience in, in Brazil or in Latin America there are other things from from Asia that are completely different from my from my world but that's that's what really nice about it it's almost as like uh, a tourism you 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 discover a little bit about the experience that are happening everywhere so that's why i really recommend everyone to read but I, it's so nice that i can't i can't choose my my, my favorite <laughs> i couldn't choose either but since you have read it Renata, do you feel like um i conveyed the gist of the book would you have more to add I think there's uh, some, some sort of, I have, what I, what I think is amazing is that sometimes uh, um, you talk about a very tangible experience and here they, they even uh, put it like a, a spirituality movements that are more religious and spiritual is not uh, completely academic. So uh, it's, it's really, really, really vast and deep. Mm -hmm. So I don't 
three. I chose those three. Ubuntu is a deeply spiritual, ancient concept, and worker-owned cooperatives and movements is something different, like the solidarity economy. There's things that you'll recognize, and then you'll think, you'll go like, what is that? <laughs> so. And they have like a mm -hmm, liberation. Uh, uh, there is a, a Catholic movement in Brazil, uh, in Latin America, uh, liberation theology. That's so important to understand because mu much of, of uh, crit critical pedagogy that we know to, today w was born from, from that movement. So here you have a small introduction there are other parts that are a chapter that I really like that is a life project. It's a chapter uh, written by Mario Blaser, who is, um, who is a, a Canada research chair, but he's from Paraguay. And he explains a different concept uh, uh, that was uh, an alternative concept to development that was created by indigenous people from, from Paraguay. There is another chapter that I love. The name is pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And pedagogy wouldn't be something that you, you think that is so transformative, but it is. Because some, some people think that you, you learn just the information, just the pure information, as if the pedagogy wasn't the most important part. How do you, how, how do you get to, to that information? How you, how you teach, what is the pedagogy? So that, that's another chapter that I, that I really like. I don't know what, what about you. <laughs> I had a hard time choosing the three. I just picked a few that um, um, were very, were quite different, and then representing different kind of different parts of the world. But so I come from more. I guess I'm curious for you all. If you're to the extent this is hosted by the Pluriversal SIG for the Design Research Society, then from a designer's perspective, what is surprising and different or even difficult to grasp? Because I'm coming from a, already coming from a development studies, critical development perspective, and it's like, great, more examples. I'm just curious, how does a designer encounter this? For me, I, I think that the, the, the challenge is to bridge because many times designers are, um, um, are really concerned with like, technology, traditional definition of technology or traditional definition of production. So how can you bring that to those ideas that are so outside of the, the center, so far away? So how can you bring those ideas to the to, to like the real life? And especially how can you can you work with your students with those ideas because it's something so far from from their reality that's something that uh, for me it's uh, it's difficult to bring those ideas from the theoretical realm to the practical realm mm -hmm. i was interested to hear so so laura one thing i will thank you for is that so I think I've I've been to um, Kotari's Research Gate link many times, and I keep looking at the book, and it's in my cart on Amazon, and I have not bought it um, as yet because every time I look at it, I'm a little bit overwhelmed <laughs> by how expansive it seems, you know. And yes. so um, I, I liked how you pulled out the few essays, you know, and, and shared for us the, um, the many different directions then or um, sources of, of information and, and knowledge. So actually now I'm probably going to both buy it tonight and download it tonight and, you know, um, continue working with it. I was interested in hearing more about that article about the SDGs, because that's a tension that I have um, where, so as a designer, I am, well, as a designer trying to operate through a critical lens, I'm trying to explore different ways of doing design, um, whether it's using different ontologies, different references, different, you know, I'm trying to break this design machine. <laughs> and then the SDGs, I had felt was a way that was helping me to do that. And I know other designers um, have somehow latched on as well to the SDGs. 
And then I remember, Renata, we had a conversation where you were critiquing the SDGs. And, and I, you know, I've started to think about it a little bit. I'm still there. I mean, my class this semester still uses the SDGs, but I'd love to, um, to hear a little bit more about that, Essie, if you, mm -hmm. if you I'll stand. say a little bit about it. Sure. Um, is that Molly is saying you second that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, my book has more sticky notes than Renata's book. Okay. <laughs> it's like, oh, there's so much to read. So this is sustainable development as a chapter. It wasn't specifically about the SDGs. And um, it goes back to the original 1987 World Commission on Environment Development and the conception of sustainable, sustainable development is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Long phrase, that's from our common future. And then, you know, the Club of Rome. And so it brings it up to the present day. And the point is that in the original 80s sustainable development, they still embraced growth. They couldn't imagine a development that was sustainable without growth, which is not possible, yet we talked about it anyway. And so the SDGs becomes this modern day, um, nice, uh, nice looking incarnation of those ideas. And you see that now growth is just hidden in item number eight. You know, if you look at all those, it has all these great um, 17 goals and then lots of indicators, but it hasn't done, done away with growth. And so it's not that the goals are bad, but that they're totally diluted by continuing to, to call for economic growth. And the situation now is so much diff more difficult and worse than in the 80s. So that's the main thing. It's really, it's more that the, um, it's just like a, a, a smoke screen for continuing things as they are. And the fact of increasing inequality and the climate change and environmental degradation we just can't keep growing an economy, so that calls that calls for redistribution. So that's why they're they're a bit toothless, aren't they? Because they make it look like a technical a technical job, and it looks like you can just split one thing up from another. Why well, you just do this goal and we'll do this goal? Well, that's absolutely no no different than what we've been doing for the last thirty years is having all these separate things, and it will put the public health experts against the. Um, education experts and against the women's empowerment, everybody thinking, you know, actually could pull people apart. I'm adding a little bit to the chapter. It doesn't get into that detail. I know you read something, but that, that's it. The, the, that's basically, and sometimes, sometimes I think it's just uh, the, the goals are, yeah, the, the goals are nice. There is not, there is nothing wrong with, with the goals, but how it can, it, it starts to be translated into, into reality. It's through really the, the, the Western lenses. The, so you, you start to think that education is about building schools and not about really questioning what, uh, <laughs> used to <laughs> the why it is important to learn how just there are many things that are, that you just just uh, uh, treat the, the reality as a, a technical problem that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's really interesting thank you um hey everyone i'm malia and i have leslie thank you for asking that question because We've talked about the SDGs before, and I just taught them to my um, introduction, my 200 level social innovation class as like a sort of framework for social impact. And I recognize that they're imperfect, but it's so, it's actually beyond kind of what they've been introduced to in terms of other types of value in other classes. Um, so I, yeah, and I agree with you, Renata, there's nothing wrong with them per se. But I think to me, the goals seem really having it, they have a little bit of a different philosophy from the Millennium Development Goals because they recognize the interconnection of the goals a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so I see more connection than separation, but I do see them being measured, like success in that area being measured the same way. Um, and I think what I would want to talk about, and I'm open to, you know, not talking about this because it might be a, heavy subject or a hefty subject, but I'm not an economist. And so when I read something like Kate Roberts book about like being growth agnostic and thinking about not having economic growth, I still in my head wonder, like, 
bad things happen to people who don't have a lot of means when there isn't economic growth, right? And so like, I don't, I don't fully understand what like degrowth looks like and maybe it just needs completely different rules around distribution. Um, but I just, I can't imagine it in my head. And maybe this is why I should read this book. Bad <laughs> things are happening to people with growth. I think fewer bad things will happen to people without growth. I think that's part of the delusion. We keep being sold a bill of goods that without economic growth, we won't get this or that. Actually, we'll still get it if we stop the economic growth fetish. Also, that becomes, a, you know, the indicators of GDP, um, even the HDI, Human Development Index, is totally tied to the GDP. If we just don't have that measure, if we don't have that fascination with that, then that just opens up the dimension. So, I, you know, it's nice to think that the 17 goals are interrelated, but in fact, you're told to kind of pick one and work on it, which totally under, under, underdoes that idea of they're being interconnected. And Kate Rayworth's book that you mentioned is called The Donut Economics. So instead of that upward, upward, which you actually see on the, on the SDGs, it's, it's a donut. Like we shouldn't go below a minimum standard and we shouldn't go beyond it. And so it actually says we have to have multiple indicators at work all the time. What does that look like? Looks like a lot of things, but it doesn't, it doesn't look like the green uh, economy. So that, that's, that's another thing, like the, the mainstream platform in the US for a green economy probably wouldn't look, I mean, it's better than nothing, definitely for moving in that direction, but. I recently had a conversation with a friend where we were talking about our capitalist society and how, um, you know, people can just get disproportionately wealthy, you know, where you get trillionaires. And um, my friend was like, you know, I think there should be a cap on the amount of wealth that a person can make. Um, because when you have that kind of money and those kinds of resources, you have so much power. I mean, you can buy influence, you can buy anything that you want. Um, and, and it's, it's not, it's not that it's not fair. It's just that it's, um, I guess, counterproductive to creating a world where we can live in harmony, where, you know, we can live in In the pluriverse. Yeah. It, actually, it's not fair. I think it's okay to say it's not fair that there's so much inequality and it's not fair that Jeff Bezos has so much money and doesn't pay taxes in England or here. And so part of the, that's why it's, it's you know, my, you might ask, what's the role of an academic in this? What is the role of a designer in this? And sometimes it means you just go vote. Like, can we get out the vote better? And get out the vote? <clears throat> and then just start out, you know, keep asking those difficult questions. So. I have another question as well. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Um, full disclosure, I read the wrong book. <laughs> so. What did you read? What? I, yes. I mean, I, 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 I re-dove re back into um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, thinking that's what oh. we're going to be discussing today. Um, yeah, but that's, that's appropriate. But that's, ne that's the next time. We're going to talk about that next time. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to frame my question with where I'm coming from. Um, so my own uh, academic expertise is literally at the intersection of design, evaluation, and international development. Um, and the, the, the recognizing that I have not yet dove into this fantastic work, um, but still struggling with the things I've been dealing with in my own uh, practices is um, developing spaces for me and other people that I work alongside that are in design to focus on to focus on the why more than the how in a way that makes them not feel hamstrung to the worlds that they've been a part of. Um, so what I mean to say is uh, the, the things that I recognize as a whole that people are used to doing in the design world um, 
it, I think I, a fantastic quote I heard on Twitter a couple of years ago was the ad, like, uh, design's natural state is to grease the wheels of capitalism um, in a litany of different ways. And there are so many different, there, there's a constant uh, discussion that happens on all of these sites about who is a designer, who engages in that practice and activity that very much so mirrors um, who has expertise and who lives um, experimental, experiential, communal, um, unvalued lives at the margins, but are still uh, doing work to <laughs> be human. Um, and that's why I really wanted to talk about pedagogy of the oppressed, because I, re I feel like there's a quote in there that is like the best definition of what it means to be human and engage in design at the same time, which is to transform the world. It is human to do so, but while simultaneously recognizing from people that um, are valuable academic, not, not just academic, but critics of how the world has been constructed, be it Afro-pessimists, be it um, what Escobar has been doing since longer than I've been alive, since um, from anybody in all of the intersectionality um, work, that the people that see folks that have lived in the world, whether they call themselves designers or not, and say, this is how we should move the world if it's uh, <laughs> Bezos or if it's Musk, Elon Musk, or if it's all of the people that look up to them as this is how the world should work and then thus design the world as the same and don't listen to the folks that said, wait a minute, what about the extraordinary amount of dangerous collateral that builds the, how we see each other, how we connect, the institutions and the hegemony that we adapt and evolve. And when I bring these conversations up with people, and talk about these alternatives of um, <laughs> the, there are different ways to look at the future that people at the margins are, are creating the future right now, what have you, um, and saying there are other ways. And most of the people in the conversations that are designers remain hamstrung. They're focused on the, the technocratic future. They, they um, not just the creating of technologies, but we make something and it will direct what it is instead of looking at the past and why those types of framings are uh, s can be exceptionally uh, limiting. So when you're trying to do that type of work, um, how do you quickly uh, frame, immediately frame why the past in the existing context is important in a way so that people will continue to shift away from what is and towards things that are more pluriversal. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Gordon, for sharing that. And I think you really enjoyed the pluriverse post development dictionary. And don't rate, um, so I just have, hang on. Neighborhood noise. Um, I, you opened up mentioning that you work at the intersection of international development and design and evaluation. And so immediately that opens up the fact that designers in that world are also not, it's not in a corporate design, but it's in, in the world of development. Who's paying the bill? Who, literally, who pays the bills? And that can shape so much. And so the question might be, how do we shift the way in which all of us are hired and can make a living so that we're actually doing things that make sense instead of beating our heads within this other system that has actually too much money and energy and power wrapped up in it for, for any one person to make a lot of difference at the moment. And then maybe Malia might have a reaction or question on that. Because she's also worked with the intersection of development and design and evaluation. I don't have any answers. <laughs> you have me thinking, like my mind is going in circles. Um, and I think one thing I was thinking about is um, going back to pedagogy of the press and thinking about like challenging dominant narratives. I wonder if like what, because it's been a while since I've read that, that quote that you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah was a way of getting at like the change needs to be led by people who have alternative perspectives. And, 
but sometimes I feel like I'm just secretly substituting like the dominant perspectives from, especially for my students with like a new hegemony of thinking. And so I don't always know like where I stand or how I feel about that. Um, so that's what that got me thinking about like, is it, if it's not designed for capitalism, is it designed for some other ideology that then becomes dominant or like, how do we really achieve the pluriverse? Mm -hmm. Like designed for many different possibilities. So no answers, just more questions. I think a lot of designers um, will find themselves in some kind of ex existential crisis, uh, you know, because, because, well, one in our education, if, if you, if you went to design school and all that, do you never get any exposed to any kind of really critical um, content? And um, I think like you, Malia, <laughs> I'm watching Pierce go, yeah. And um, yeah, I, I really, okay. So I, I mean, I grew up in contexts where I could interact with critical material, but I, I never really got it in my education, probably until my PhD. Um, even though I grew up in Trinidad, I lived in Brazil, I, you know, it was finally maybe in my PhD that I started to, to really think about this stuff in a more academic space. But like you, Malia, as a designer, um, I am constantly thinking, okay, I'm trying to work in a better way, but I'm a capitalist at heart. You know, or, um, you know, because I'm, I'm, tra I'm trained, I suppose, in a certain way. And so I think I'm doing better, but really maybe the better is just as bad as the original, you know, and, and then sometimes this is a very public thing that I'm going through in my head with you all, you know, so sometimes I'll tell myself, well, okay, maybe my better is a little better because I'm a black woman from Trinidad or, <laughs> you know, um, we, we find ways of, <sighs> thinking of, yeah, how are we just doing it a little bit better? You know, Pierce, you asked about the, you were looking at the how and the why. And I think that my questions very often still focus on the what and the how. And I, I sometimes need to more consciously shift the argument to the why, but I don't think we are ever really trained to ask those questions. Um, in design. So I think my how is better, mm -hmm. which it may not be, but I need to go a step back and really think of the why. I see some heads nodding. And you're not alone. Not, not learning critical theory is a part of all positive social science training, and I would say probably most public health doctrinal training. And I did a PhD a long time ago in planning and got a little bit. And I still, so I think it's it's actually something we're always uncovering and we're learning. But the point is you get caught up and you have to pay your mortgage or you pay your student debt and then you feel trapped and then you end up telling yourself stories about what you're doing. Many people to survive because you're trapped in this uh, global capitalist economy. So what yeah. the first does is open up some possibilities of well, what if we didn't need money? What if we could live in you know, transition towns and local currencies and a local farmers movement. And that can seem, it can seem so ridiculous, but it's also totally feasible. So why do we allow it to be? But even now with the COVID situation, many people decided to, to, to move out of big cities, go to a smaller town. So you, you don't need that much money because we still need money. We still need the money. But how can we just uh, reduce the, the, that need so we are not like, like hamsters in, a, in the wheel all the time trying to make more and more and more. So how can we try to design our lives, our lives in a way that uh, you can really have another kind of, uh, another uh, lifestyle? That, that's the challenge and it's not easy it's not obvious at all <laughs> i took a course as an undergraduate called future perfect human um and it was all about asking the question you know what does it mean to be human what what characteristics are uh 
you know, like what are the characteristics that make a human a human and and how is that different than an animal or um, then there were that we talked about concepts of monsters versus humans of robots versus humans um, and I was trying to find the syllabus for the course that's why I was like getting all this stuff out um, but I the, I don't have the syllabus anymore but um, I have a bunch of notes from different lectures in that class but it was just it was probably well it was certainly the most difficult course that i took as an undergraduate because um the professor really pushed everybody to read like all these different kinds of stories um and then we had to go in and and analyze it and and think about different parts of human nature and um i guess it was very pluriversal you know at the end of the day so I guess maybe I was lucky that I got exposed to some of these concepts very early. Um, I just didn't know it at the time. And, and my academic mind thought literally that professor probably got terrible reviews from the students. <laughs> probably because it, she was hard, you know, and, and um, but yeah, there was an incredible amount of reading and, and writing and I mean, it was, very conceptual you know it wasn't like a biology course where you just learn you know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell and you write that on an exam you know this was there really were no right or wrong answers it was like okay here's a question here's kind of a philosophical question what do you think about it and support your point and that was that was hard mm -hmm. I see Jane has unmuted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was, I was just wondering if I could jump in here. Um, we're talking about sort of learning and pedagogy and, and stuff. I, I was very interested, Laura, when you were talking about worker-led production and you just sort of edged into us remaking ways of education that were more collaborative and and sort of breaking down some of the hierarchies and sort of universities. And I'm really interested in that. I wondered if you could expand on that a bit. Sure, I was talking about worker-led production and that comes out of an industrial, like the decline of industry. And so basically those were survival strategies in Argentina, workers kind of taking over after these companies had collapsed and producing stuff. And then um, also a European solidarity, solidarity economy and cooperative movements which then comes out of an industrial or artisanal tradition. So now I guess it just started me to think about what could designers do with this to run your lives as designers? What are different ways you could organize your design practices and skills and get paid for it? Um, and I'm a professor and I think was joking with my students, what if um, I didn't you know, get, get a salary so much as just work for tips, right? Like the service industry workers, how would that look, right? Why do we take things for granted? And so the worker-led production just starts you to really think about who pays the bills, who gets to own things, who's in charge of what, and what do we need to make in this world? So universities have become more in the US, even in the UK, I know there's a lot of regulations and it's, it's not what I dreamed of, you know, in, in, in uh, thinking about a career in academia and it's still a wonderful place, but um, it could be different. So that's kind of where I was thinking. Yes, I agree. And I've been doing a little bit of reading around, um, is it Fred Moten and the Undercommons and sort of pushing against the hierarchy. <laughs> There's some great books being recommended up here. <laughs> and I, I'm just, I've been trying to do some curriculum design. I teach at an American university in London and it's, um, sort of trying to collaboratively construct curriculum with students so it's not just you know the professors deciding what's what's done and and trying to structure courses where students decide when they hand in work so it's negotiated so it's particularly now i think in this time with covid it's thrown everything up in the air and we have an opportunity to you know shake it down differently um, and I, I don't know, I'm, 
I think that's quite exciting somehow. Cool. Yeah, some good titles there. Yeah, I wanted to say someone had previously said, you know, I'm not an economist and I'm kind of coming at this from that perspective. So I, I would preface my comments on that too. Like I'm not an economist, obviously. But I did find that these two books were really great, like talking about relationships between design and economy and alternatives. Like well, there's Guy Julia's book, Economies of Design. So he does have a section on that. And I also really like Joanna Bonert's writing on that too. Um, and so she has this book and she has like various other papers and stuff like that that go pretty, pretty deeply into it. Uh, we have eight minutes. Who wants to grab the mic and just say something? <laughs> Um, no, now I'll go all teacherly and say, it. so I have, there are people in this group who I am fans of and haven't said anything yet. Pedro, you're lurking in the background. What are you going to tell us today? You know, I like listening to people. The people have so many things to say and I, I really appreciate learning from this community. So I, I, I like to stay in the background. Um, I mean, all I will, I'll say is, maybe share some of my internal thinking around this. I, you know, I, I'm, lately I questioned really the role of designers in, I mean, uh, as, prof as a profession and, and coming back to the questions of, you know, somebody shared, I think it was uh, Dr. Gordon who shared things about the why and the how, and you shared, you think about the what. And it seems to me, I can't think of many things in the realm of design as I think we understand it, like separate, well, sep or adjacent to science and engineering that need to be put out in the world. It seems to me there's a lot of work in redesigning things and making those things bend to, make the arc of those things bend towards justice. And that to me seems to be connected with the people that those things that need to be redesigned are being impacted by. So the more I see design programs focusing on students, uh, you know, learning how to, how to unveil the history of the communities that are impacted by the things that are compelling by, uh, for them the more I see uh, programs putting out more methods and, and critical theory connected on how to work with people, particularly people who have not been centered in the past, I see more, you know, the, the, the importance of the who and the, the importance of designers in, in situating themselves as redesigners and, and trying to, to yeah, modify a lot of the social technical systems that we are embedded in right now that are making things so complicated and sometimes make it difficult for us to appreciate the possibility of other worlds. That will be my, my two cents to this conversation and, and same as Dr. Gordon, appreciate everybody's openness and, and contributions. It's really neat to hear from everybody. Thank you. Anybody else wants to say anything before we start to close up? Renata, you want to pick on some people? <laughs> so, no, but thank you so much for, for, for your contribution today. And I really think that this, this, this book, it deserves, it's free. It deserves to be downloaded. And exactly. if, if you need to give anywhere a uh, context about development or like post development, the introduction is so great. And then all the inspiration here, yeah, just d please download this book. <laughs> you, you won't regret. Mm -hmm. Thank you so yeah. much, Laura, for, for, your, for your presentation. Oh, thank you, Renata, for, I had heard about it last year, but I, you know, with the stacks of books, I hadn't really paid attention to it. So then when Renata said, read this, I thought, yes, I, you know, I should revisit that. So I'd love to keep talking about it with people. Um, I also want to share that there's a community, um, um, I put it in the chat, a global tapestry of alternatives. And it's just a very impressive, warm-hearted, collaborative community of people. And the, the metaphor of a tapestry is wonderful. It's, you know, wonderful. And it cares for you and it's handmade and 
It's not a machine, and right? So we need to use better metaphors. Um, the Global Tapestry of Alternatives is led by basically the editors of the book, and it's a set of, a set of webinars and convenings, and they are making use of, of Zoom. So in other words, the COVID era has actually allowed people to connect in ways that wasn't possible before. Um, so sign up and enjoy some of those things and just, just appreciate, maybe be part of that somehow. So anyway, thank you. I'm glad that you all enjoyed it. I'm glad I could have this conversation with you all.